Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. We have with us a special guest back for round two on the Fertility in Focus podcast, Dr. Jesse Hayde, to talk to us about PRP today. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Christine. It's uh, amazing, amazing to be here. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you for bringing your expertise on this very avant-garde topic. I can't wait to hear all about it. Let's jump right in. What is PRP? So PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma, and it's actually a technique that's been around since the 70s that the hematologists developed for patients who had low capability of clotting their blood. Um, there are certain diseases that patients face that before surgery, and it was a means to try and gather platelets and help increase the clotting factor. Oh, since the 70s, and I guess that's about 50 years now, if my math serves me correctly, um, sometimes I have to pull an abacus out to figure out what the heck is going on, <laughs> for anyone who knows what an abacus is. But anyway, um, yeah, but since then, we've actually figured out that platelets do a lot more than just clotting, uh, help promote the clotting capability of blood and for wound healing. So... There, they, we found out there's about 30 different growth factors and there's other proteins called cytokines, which are instructional, instructional proteins that help tell uh, cells what to do, when to do it, where to do it. Um, so it, it's really fascinating. Since then, they've been using it in, in multitude of fields, specifically dermatology, um, plastic surgery. They've even looked at it for open heart surgery to reduce scarring and increase the cardiac motion and, and the healing process uh, and the myocardial cells. Um, just fascinating. For about three years now, uh, three to four years, uh, it's been employed as an adjuvant therapy to patients undergoing IVF um, in the fertility community. Amazing. And so when I originally heard of PRP a few years back, um, there was a practice in New York doing it um, for women who were basically postmenopausal or perimenopausal, sure. and they were doing ovarian PRP, which as I understand it, there's not a lot of support for. I would love to hear your opinion about that. And I think, you know, when we were talking, there's been a bit more of the PRP for the uterus for implantation. Is that correct? Uh, well, we actually use it for both. And the majority of the PRP I use is actually for ovarian PRP uh, and not necessarily for women who are menopausal. Hmm. So if you think of PRP, it's not stimulating stem cells to grow and produce follicles. Think of it more like a resuscitative measure. You see someone go down and you need to do CPR on them. Um, so if you're in menopause, you've been in menopause for, for four years, five years, it's like finding a person who's been dead for a week and you go and start doing CPR. It's not going to work. Right. right? No matter how yeah. good you are at CPR, it's unfortunately not going to work. That is that uh, is such a perfect analogy because those are the cases that I saw it used in. And I, and I just, I was like, I, I mean, this will be a miracle if it does. It would be very fascinating. Right. Okay. So I would love the specifics of, of, you know, what you're using it for. Yeah, so we generally use it for women who are who have what's called DOR, diminished ovarian reserve, or POR, poor ovarian response. Two separate things, but they're intertwined with one another. So women with uh, poor ovarian, uh, diminished ovarian reserve, meaning low egg counts. And there's criteria that have been pushed around by ESHRI, which is the European Society for Re Reproductive Endocrinology, where they look at specifically your age, what your AMH and your antral follicle counts and prior egg retrievals, number of eggs retrieved and response. So women with diminished ovarian reserve typically will have fewer than seven follicles that are counted um, and have fewer than that that respond during an egg retrieval. There are some women who come in and actually have a, a, a normal to robust egg reserve. They'll have somewhere between 15 and 20 follicles but when you start stimulating them, they have very few follicles that respond, or when they do respond, uh, they're either very delayed in their response and their poor response to the trigger shot to tell and instruct the eggs to come out of the follicles. 
So that's one group of individuals that we, we use it on are, are those who are poor responders and who have diminished ovarian reserve. We also have employed it, but it's, it's just less beneficial for those women who are perimenopausal and specifically menopausal. The, the perimenopausal, you'll get them to ovulate more frequently. So if someone is ovulating maybe once every three to six months, you may get that more uh, to once every other month. Uh, but those women who are truly menopausal, this technique I'm finding is probably the least benefit. It doesn't improve anything because um, for the most part, it's not going to create eggs from nothing. And that's the bottom line. It's a resuscitative measure. It's an adjuvant therapy. So the whole goal and the concept is, is should women be using this before they go into IVF? Because what we do know in our pilot study and it was a small study of 34 patients, but we use them as their own control. Before PRP, they did about 150 egg retrievals, this group of 34 women, and they had about on average 1.5 eggs retrieved. After at least one or more PRPs, and really you saw the benefit after the third PR, after the second and going into the third PRP, where they went from an average of 1.5 to an average of 2.5 or more. Follicles and eggs. That's that's a, a, so it's a 66% improvement, which other groups and other studies have shown. But again, when you're dealing with small numbers mm -hmm. and you're using the patients as their own control, as opposed to, because if I do something for someone, for example, and I say, here, take this pill or this medication, it's going to improve your outcome. Just by you believing that it's going to work will increase your chance of success by 15%. So you're changing the outcome just based on your belief. And maybe my belief too, whatever I'm doing, maybe I'm doing things slightly different just subconsciously that I don't even recognize that I want it because I want it to work. You want it to work that we're actually changing the outcome. So that's why when you're actually doing a study and there are no studies out there yet, and I do say yet, that do randomized, uh, double-blinded, placebo control where you don't know what you're getting. You're getting something. I don't know what you're getting, but you're getting something. And then you start to look at the, the differences in the outcome. That's amazing. You did mention offline that uh, there's a study cooking over there at, at, uh, at Generation Next. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so we're, we're submitting right now a proposal to do a... An, a really an official first of its kind PRP study looking at that versus a placebo and it's going to be randomized double-blinded placebo like the best type of study that you can do that's rarely ever done in the fertility world so it's really going to be it will put it to rest does PRP work and if it is working are you not only improving numbers but are you actually improving the quality of the eggs and that's the one thing that nobody knows the problem is, is because you have to look at endpoint, which is live birth or blastocyst formation, euploid blast formation, because in this population, the blast formation is, is fairly low because you're getting few eggs and you're going to have few blastocysts and how many of those are going to be euploid and how many of those are going to be, you need such a tremendous number of patients in it, which may or may not be realistically achievable, but it all depends on how much the benefit is. The greater the benefit the fewer the patients you'll need, the lower the benefit, the larger the number of patients you'll need to um, encourage to enter this study. But it's going to be a first of its kind. If that's the case, then it will come off the experimental list. And that's the whole goal when you're doing studies and research. You're trying to say this should be mainstream. So if you're going to do IVF or even IUIs, whatever you're going to do, if this is truly found to not only increase number of follicles that will respond, but also the quality of the eggs that you're going to get and the process of blast formation, blastocyst formation and embryo creation and chromosomal normalcy, which can lead to live birth, then it makes no sense to not do this prior to. Uh, other things that we don't know is what's the best timing to do this? How much well, lead sure time? That's the kind of thing. Yeah, that's probably some of the things that you're trying out in the clinic, which is amazing. Yeah. And you're already getting results. And it sounds like, is it like I should ask you, is there any harm to doing this procedure? So because it's your own, what we call autologous blood. So it's basically your blood. 
Mm -hmm. And we're using a very special test tube to separate out the red and white blood cells that creates some of the inflammation and uh, when you have an injury. And what you're doing is you're just reconstituting the platelets and you're concentrating them in that serum that's left over to create plasma. And you're concentrating the platelets to about 500 to 700% higher than what's in the normal circulation. So if you say, okay, I want to just do IVF for someone and not inject something in. Well, I need to know, is it the injury itself that's creating the maybe improvement and outcome for future cycles? Or is it the actual you're you're putting in the platelets that are surrounding in the area where the follicles that will be forming in the future will come from that could be responsive? Is it help promoting their um, their health and reducing the amount that are undergoing what's called atresia and death? so that they can become future antral follicles that can respond to the medications that we utilize during an IVF cycle. So fascinating. Yeah, it's very, but you know, that's for ovarian. For uterine, it's it's a whole other issue too. So again, because it promotes, think of platelets as general contractors. They're just instructing the cells and that are normally found in the organ that you're utilizing it in to regenerate increased vascularity, so blood supply, so that you get more nutrients, oxygen, and other factors that are required for the tissue to function at its optimal manner. How so what that? That's a, because it, there's a lot of growth factors in things. Ah. In things. So that's the thing. I don't think anyone really knows. Mm -hmm. So how is it affecting it? Well, it's affecting it probably at the level of... Um, the cell function and how is it doing it? I don't think it's clearly elucidated, but when you start to look at it, it may improve repair mechanisms in the cell so that they are able to repair themselves in an easier manner, uh, may reduce uh, DNA breakages. It's unclear, it really is unclear. And that's why it has the name right or for wrong, like when you're using it in the ovary, like ovarian rejuvenation. And most of the studies have been done really in cosmetics and, and dermatology and plastic surgery, working on skin cells. And that's why people do like what's called microneedling and you're injecting lots of PRP because it's plumping up and, and tightening and rejuvenating the, the fibroblasts or the skin cells. Um, to oh, function. that's interesting. Cause I was gonna, I was gonna say there, they must be using this in beauty. Um, because they it's like do. That. yeah, <laughs> they do. people use it for hair loss. So it, it has a lot of benefits, but the thing is, is who is the benefit? Mm -hmm. That's the biggest question. So like when patients call me and they say, Hey, I heard about PRP, I'm thinking of using it. Um, am I a candidate? Well, the answer is everyone's technically a candidate, but whether or not you'll respond, that remains to be seen. And that's the whole thing is, can you paint a picture and figure out who are the best candidates that we will work for and who are the poorest candidates that you say, listen, these are expensive, they're invasive techniques, it's probably not worth your money to attempt this because other patients with similar demographics and, and will have the poorest outcome. So that's how you have to look at it. Um, so it's just all trying to figure out who gets the benefit. And that's why, especially in uterine factor, uh, these are women, uterine factors, it's, it's the reason why it's used the least is because it only represents 1% of all the patients that we see in the infertility industry. So that's the least common cause for why women don't get pregnant. Um, but there are a lot of women out there who have very thin endometriums, uh, two millimeters, three millimeters, either through prior surgery, and there is some type of damage to the endometrium that it's no longer responding to estrogen, or just naturally, they just have something probably either genetically missing or something going on that's reducing the ability of the endometrium to respond. And we're having some, some nice results with this as well. Uh, just because you can increase the thickness doesn't also guarantee that you're going to have an implantation as well. But again, that's part of the what you're trying to prove is that, okay, if I increase it, we do know that women who have endometrial thickness that's above seven millimeters tend to do better and have higher pregnancy rates than those women who have less than seven millimeters. Um, but there are plenty of women who get pregnant with very thin endometriums all the time. 
And that's why it, it's unclear. That's why a lot of these things, that's why it's still considered experimental because we don't know enough about it. And that's why we want to do this, the groundbreaking study and show that this is it. This is, it's either going to work or it's just a flash in the pan and maybe we have to move on to other things. Well, thank you for being part of a movement to try to, you know, progress in the industry. I know, you know, I know yeah. that there are others, but I think you guys are rather daring in in a good way that that you're like, you know what, I like if if you don't see this route working, you're gonna try and try yeah. and 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 figure out what is going to work. In terms of you know the logistics of going through something like this. What what would a patient be looking at? Like how many treatments? What's the average cost? Um, you know, what's the timeline? And I know you said you're playing around with that, but what, what are you doing so far? So usually the month prior to starting the treatment is when we do the first uh, injections. And then from there, uh, they're usually doing it monthly and they're doing egg retrievals along the way because again, these are women with low reserve, more advanced age, and they generally will need a higher threshold of eggs retrieved to have that live birth because they're looking for a chromosomally normal embryo. Um, and But what's interesting, and because most of these women that we've been looking at in our prior study with the 34 patients, they were banking because they had such low reserve. Remember, they went from 1.5 to 2.5, and we were banking all these embryos. And so they were saying, okay, now we're finally starting to use them. And we're having some really pleasant um, surprises in, in the pregnancy rates that we're seeing uh, in the embryos that, that have been formed from it. So really, really amazing stuff. That's really great. And are there any negative side effects to it? Well, because remember, it's your own blood. It's not like you're going to have an allergic reaction. Like, so it's not like when you're, you have, you know, someone has COVID and you're giving convalescent plasma, which is basically pooled plasma from a bunch of individuals who've had COVID and you're extracting the plasma with the antibodies in it. Here, I've, it's your blood. So it's not like you're going to have a reaction to your own blood. The problem is, is, is that because it's a surgical reinsertion of it because of where the, the organs are located, right? Their internal organs, the ovaries, the uterus. Um, uterus is a little bit easier to do, um, but because there's a surgical in injection of this into the ovaries, um, it has the same risk that an egg retrieval would have, blood loss, infection. Um, really, you're talking very, very, very rare occurrences um, one in 50,000 for an infection, one in 20,000 or so for a major hemorrhage following uh, some type of egg retrieval or theoretically when you're doing these injections. It's very rare. So I don't look at them as far as these are minimally invasive procedures. They're probably, uh, the risk is, is very, uh, is so low that I don't think like this should be something that, sh that someone should not do it because of. Um, the most common side effect is usually pain at the injection site. And even that's very low. We're talking about somewhere between three and 5% mm -hmm. of patients and it's up to their own pain threshold. Oh, for sure. I've had patients do it and I yeah. really haven't heard complaints. And I think yeah. maybe that's one of the reasons why this is such, you know, a great thing to be exploring because um, it's not crazy expensive. It's easy yeah. enough to integrate into yeah. um, the treatment plan and it's not overly invasive. Yeah, it, it's minimally invasive, but it's still, there's anesthesia for the most part. And, but you, these are five minute procedures you're talking about. These are not an hour long, two hour long. You're talking about three to five minutes, the entire procedure. Um, so they're very quick. Great. And then, so for patients and, and our listeners, you know, if they're in the, the throes of a fertility journey, at which point in their journey would you say, okay, maybe let's try this out? Is it after they've already had several failures? You know, they've had canceled cycles because their eggs won't develop? Or when would you suggest starting? That's a tough question. So it's experimental, right? So anytime you're de dealing with, it, with an experimental procedure, it's not the mainstream, it's not the standard of care. So it's it that's an individual's decision, right? So you have to look at 
do I have insurance coverage for these treatments and how much or do I not? And do I have to pay for things out of pocket? And if I'm paying for out of pocket, is it worth adding this as an adjuvant therapy to maximize my chances prior to, you know, while I'm spending all this money? Because it's, it's not that dramatically increased uh, amount of money that adds to the cycle. But, you know, each treatment is, it, it, you're just trying to maximize each treatment. So I think that's an individual call. Like I have some patients who call me because they failed cycles. And then um, I have amazing results every once in a while. And the patient and I will look at each other and say, we can't believe that what kind of outcome that we're having here. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it's hard to say because not everyone will have that benefit mm -hmm. and it's hard to say justify putting an expense on experimental therapy um if you have very limited resources at least i would say if you're not gonna if you're thinking of doing this and you have enough maybe it's worth trying one cycle without it and then this way at least you can compare and contrast but the thing is is you have to have realistic expectations because in some women it takes time for the prp and that's what i'm saying you need at least two three treatments in some people before you see an, uh, an improvement. And some people you see it right away. Two weeks after the first injection, you're already seeing um, almost a doubling of the cohort in, in select individuals. So you that's what you don't- You mean doubling of the, of the antral follicle count? Yeah. And that quickly? In some individuals, yes. So the, if you look at most studies, they'll show a mean time of onset is about 35, 30 to 35 days, within 35 days, mm -hmm. an improvement. But some see it much later on. Uh, I have some people almost like six months later, now all of a sudden you're seeing we've stopped the injections and now you see all of a sudden for a few cohorts, they'll have much larger cohorts than they've had um, prior to that. So it, it's just interesting. You don't know when you're going to see it because the life expectancy uh, or from the life cycle of a follicle goes from primordial follicles to primary to secondary to antral follicles. Antral follicles are the only ones that we can see on ultrasound and those are the ones that actually respond to hormonal manipulation and medications. The primordial follicles on the primary and the secondary, you can't see. And to go from a primordial to being selected and say, okay, today you're going to be selected and you're going to go and become an antral follicle, that process could take six, seven months before you actually see that follicle uh, actually enter into a, a cohort, somewhere between 120, 180 days. Um, so because there's that such variability and from person to person, you may not see that until the delayed response. And that's the thing you don't know because we're not following patients long enough. You know, that's the whole key that you don't have this long follow-up window, which is interesting though. Yeah. Well, hopefully in the study, you'll have, you get more clear. And I've seen this with like, you know, my modes of treatment that some respond very quickly. Some take a lot longer. Everybody's body's a little bit different. Yeah. It's exactly right. Yeah, but but uh, and, and I think that's why it takes so much time to really confirm whether this is something that you would do. But I would say, you know, what it sounds like to me is, um, you know, if patients are are open and willing and and really looking for, you know, something else to add to potentially augment their results, then this could be something to ask for. Um, but otherwise, Absolutely. you know might not be the first thing that you recommend, given that it still is in the experimental stage. Right. Well, that's hope, but hopefully um, with our, with more data and a mm -hmm. proper study, we can put this to rest and finalize it. Oh, I know you're going to get this done. You're I hope so. I, I Well, I know we'll get it done, but uh, we just need patients to start. Once we have the study ready, we'll It'll start, you know, go on the CDC website because any any study that's uh, open to the public, uh, they'll be uh, aware of and they'll be able to sign up if they desire to sign up for it. Oh, good. So then our listeners, if they want to be part of your study, is that something they could contact the center about or no? Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of inclusion, exclusion criteria. We, you know, th there's a lot of things that people have to be aware of. Uh, and they have to meet the criteria because they have to get a more uniform cohort of individuals to say, OK, at least in this population, it either works or it doesn't work. And maybe we're focusing on the wrong population. Maybe in reality, it should be for 
normal responders. Maybe even if I can get a 10% improvement in outcome, that's 10% less IVF cycles that people have to do. Well, yeah, and that's really helpful because I- And knew that's where the savings is. Absolutely. And, and you know, cost-wise, that's amazing, but for sanity. You know, if yeah. I know anything about um, the women going through this journey, they're just like, can this just be over now? Like, I just yeah. want to check this box and move on to the next thing. So I love what you guys are doing, that you're offering this option and that you're really going to dig in and get that um, data for everyone to, to see, yeah. you know, exactly who this is for and who it will help. And I really appreciate you being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, always ask always the best questions. I have to be honest with you. <laughs> you flatter me. <laughs> no, you do. You always do. You, you have your finger on the pulse. That's all I can tell you. Uh, thank you. Well, we'll be sure to have you back again to talk about thank the you. results. As I understand it, PRP can be used for ovarian rejuvenation, as they call it, or for the uterus. What are you using it for at Generation Next? As I understand it, PRP can be used for the ovaries to quote unquote rejuvenate them or for the uterus to help the lining and implantation.